Penguins made it official yesterday. Ron Hextall is their new GM. Brian Burke is the president of Hockey Ops. Patrick Line, Line up the ice, and he scores! Throw me a Line! And Line's gonna fight Hagel. The gloves are on the ice. Line comes with a couple of rights over top. Set up the high slot. Kane, wrist shot, he scores! Patrick Kane! Oh, did he fire a laser past Corpusello? Hey everybody, welcome into another edition of Our Line Starts with Dominic Moore and Anton Carter this week. I'm Catherine Tappan. Ace, I gotta commend you. You're still wearing your Valentine's Day pink. I love it. <laughs> every day is Valentine's Day, KT. So every day, don't be afraid to send me some flowers too. Me too, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it the other way around. Shouldn't you be sending me flowers? <laughs> it's 2021. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Touche. Okay, I understand. How are you guys doing this week? Not too bad. We had my, my daughter's first birthday this weekend, so that was our Valentine's Day activity. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. Congrats to her. That's so exciting. Your first birthday. Did you put her face in the cake or did you do anything? Oh, like yeah. That? Yeah. My wife made the old smash cake and she just absolutely annihilated it. <laughs> Ate very little, but that's okay. We cleaned up the scraps and, and uh, you know, enjoyed that. So it was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Well, it's good to have you guys here. We've got, um, as always, a lot to get to. Um, let's start with last week, uh, the breaking news out of Pittsburgh. And I think this sent all of us for shock. Uh, Brian Burke named as the director of hockey ops and Ron Hextall hired as the new general manager. So clearly the Pittsburgh Penguins making a huge move. These two guys are so well respected in hockey, uh, Dom and Ace. They've had over 50 years combined experience between the two of them. We know all their accolades. We know where they came from. Brian Burke was on TV at the time, but the Sportsnet, even his colleagues didn't know this was happening. And Ron Hextall, of course, the former general manager most recently of the Philadelphia Flyers. So Ace, I'll start with you. When you heard the news, what did you think of this big decision by the Penguins to hire these two as their front office? I was shocked with uh, Brian Burke. I wasn't so shocked when it came to Ron Hextall. And I think that both these individuals, these executives, will complement each other very well. They do exactly what the other person doesn't really want to do on a regular basis. Ron Hextall wants to scout. He wants to develop. He wants to look for young players. He wants to find those diamonds in the rough, like a Carter Hart um, or Travis Konechny. And Brian Burke is a tremendous seller. He's great in the community. He's got that electric personality. He's got that big personality. So I really think both of these two will vibe off each other very effectively. Yeah, for me, the interesting thing is just the whole question about what is the approach? You know, they, they, a lot of people are saying they were brought in right now to focus on next year. Um, you know, that may be true. They need some time to get up and running, to kind of evaluate what they have. Um, but this is a team that they don't want to go into that kind of L.A. Chicago rebuild with with stars that are on the closing side of their their kind of winning window. And so with Crosby, Latang, and Malkin uh, at the age that they are still playing well, but that window is closing. They couldn't afford to kind of go back to, to the drawing board. So uh, I think with guys that have that much experience, uh, bringing them in early enough so that they have time to evaluate this year, because Ace, I don't know what you think, but. They're not a contender to me right now. They're not. I mean, you look at their, their decor. And they, Dumoulin's not in right now, but even if Dumoulin's there, I don't think they are. Up front, they're not as deep as they've been in previous years. But it, for me, it comes down to goaltending. Jari and DeSmith, I don't think are going to be the answer. If they're able to get Marc-Andre Fleury, you know, we talked about that. We joked about that in the broadcast. KT was starting those rumors all over again, and myself <laughs> and Sharpie bought into it a little bit. But if they can solidify the goaltending, that's everything. There's so much parity in the National Hockey League these days that if you've got a goaltender that can make the biggest difference, then you're talking about a team that's the difference between just making the playoffs or a team that's the potential Stanley Cup winner that season. Yeah, for me, the, even if they were able to shore up the goaltending, they're still not a contender. I mean, I think, you know, Crosby's Crosby. He makes everyone around him better. Rust is having a, a great season, um, you know, off to a great start, leading the team in points and, and Gensel starting to kind of reestablish re his game, but that's just Crosby making him everyone around him better. For me, guys like Brandon Tanev are kind of allowing this team to win some games. He, he had, you know, third line, the, you know, was a big difference yesterday again. Um, you know, so I, I think there's still a lot of pieces missing though from this group, even if they shored up the goaltending. You guys, there were so many off-season changes that I mean, most of Mike Sullivan 
Sullivan staff was let go coming into this year. So they, they revamped behind the bench. You talk about the superstars that are probably not going anywhere in the near future and Sidney Crosby of Genny Malkin. You know, you mentioned the defense is a little bit depleted. The goaltending is a question mark. I don't think Mark andre Fleury is coming back to Pittsburgh. All the Pittsburgh Penguins fans would love that. Vegas has other words for that. Um, but, you know, would you say in the immediate future that the most pressing need right now would be the goaltending situation? Or is this more of this team just has a lot of holes and two people in Brian Burke and Ron Hextall cannot be possibly responsible for fixing all of them? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, like I said, I think the goaltending is just the beginning. And I think Burke and Hextall have their work cut out for them. I think they're going to take some time to evaluate what they have. And then they're going to hope to try and fill in those holes. But it's not easy when you've got, you know, you have to have value to get value when you're making trades and trying to kind of create a team. And, and I don't know, they have some, some parts that they could potentially move. And I don't necessarily want to be a rumor starter either, but, you know, they may realize later on that they might have to move a Latang or even a Malkin, which seems unthinkable right now. Um, and I know that's not what they want to do, but they may, they may get to that point later when they realize, Hey, we, we have to have, we have to give up something of value in order to try to get something back of value so that we can contend in this closing window. Yeah, I think, I think I would start with a goaltender. And yes, no one really knows where Gino's game is going to be from game to game. It's really been a little bit inconsistent. But I think about Latang, a little high risk, high reward. He played well against the Washington Capitals recently, a tremendous pass down low to Brian Russ. But I still go back to the goaltending. I, you look at the St. Louis Blues, it's a couple years ago. St. Louis Blues, I think they're in last place or they're floundering in the Western Conference. Nobody's talked to the St. Louis Blues as the potential Stanley Cup champion. You know, after the preseason, the preseason, you talked about them like, yeah, they could have a run maybe if a lot of things fall into place. But January rolled around. You wouldn't even think about the St. Louis Blues. <laughs> then Jordan Winnington, a.k.a. Jordan Biddington, came to the table, played lights out net minding. And what do you know? They're hoisting the Stanley Cup in the Midwest. So I really think that goaltending is a big key in the National Hockey League today. It starts there. Don might agree there's other holes to be fixed, but if they could solidify that position with consistent goaltending, at least they have a chance, and then you never know what could happen. All right, guys, let's move on to the Central Division because things have become a lot more interesting in the Central Division thanks to the Dubois line A trade that happened between the Blue Jackets and the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, and then there was the subsequent line A Tortorella drama, which uh, always makes for interesting conversation and banter on the airwaves. Let's take a look at the uh, Central Division odds brought to you by PointsBet and focus on two teams in the Central Division, guys. And I want you to look at the Chicago Blackhawks who are in a position that I don't think anybody expected them to be at the start of the season. And then below them, two teams down would be the Columbus Blue Jackets. Let's start with the Blue Jackets here. Do we think things have settled down with the drama? I mean, Dom, you played for John Tortorella. You know how he runs his systems and how he uh, you know, conducts his locker room and his players. Are we through with the drama? And are we going to see what we need to see from line A? And is this now in the rearview mirror and Columbus is trying to make a run here? So I want to say one thing about this Tortorella drama. And we talked about this ace when my first day in the studio, we were talking about the Dubois situation. And what I said about Torts then is that he was tough, but he's fair. And I'm standing by that right now with the line A situation. You've got a situation where there apparently was a little disrespect to one of the assistant coaches. Okay. And Torts is a principled guy. And, and that kind of thing is not going to fly. And the best part about it, though, is that line A respects it, okay? He comes away out of the heat of the moment, and he says, you know what? That's right. And he values being in an organization where principles and fairness are valued. So to me, this was actually a blessing in disguise to have this situation happen out of the gate with line A's arrival. And I think it strengthened the relationship. I think line A is glad to be in a position where he has a coach that will treat everyone the same. I think I would have loved playing for Torts, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sad that I missed him because, you know, he's a guy that I think I would have loved to be in that kind of an environment where, you know, hard work and, uh, you know, merit and, and everyone's treated as an equal. I think that's a great environment as a player. Listen, I don't have a problem with, with Torts benching lining. You know, I, I really don't because 
My problem that I have with torts benching P.L. Dubois, yes, your coaching staff has to hold you accountable, but the first job as a head coach is put you in a position to have success. And he sat that kid for most of that first period. So what do you expect when the kid finally goes out there and plays, like, I think it was third shift in that first period against the defending Stanley Cup champs, who he dominated previously. What do you expect? Yeah, the kid's going to be upset. He's a young kid. He's 22 years old. So that was my issue with torts having that negative effect in this player, setting him up for failure. Now when it comes to Patrick Lina, yes, Dom, you've got to hold your players accountable. If you're going to lip off your assistant coaches, you should be on the pine. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. Patrick Liney's attitude hasn't been an issue. He always wanted more. And I said it before, I'm going to say it again. He's getting the real second overall experience now in Columbus. He never had that in Winnipeg. Usually when you're drafted that high, you normally go to a team that's offensively challenged, you're going to play a ton of minutes. You've got a lot of responsibility. He went to Winnipeg. He was a second-line winger. He didn't play that much because they had Wheeler and Shifley. And they had other guys ahead of him that were expected to pull the, co- the horse or pull the carriage, sorry, because he's the horse. He gets to Columbus now. He's the guy. He's dropping the mitts. He's scoring goals. I mean, I can't wait to see how Pacioliani develops. I mean, Liam said it on the broadcast. He fights like how he plays. He's all offense and no defense. I'm sure that <laughs> might change. <laughs> I have a question. Of, have you guys ever been in a situation like this, uh, either been on the receiving end of a situation like this with a coach, or have you seen a fellow teammate go through something like this where you know uh, what it's like in this situation? You know, actually, what comes to mind when you bring that up, KT, is an experience with, with some of, an official. Uh, my rookie year in the league um, – I remember I, you know, I took a lot of face-offs as a centerman and I remember getting heated and one of the linesmen, the way they dropped the puck or something happened that got me really upset. And I kind of gave it to the linesman and I was a rookie and, and later, later in the, in the period, veteran ref uh, Bill McCreary came over and skated over to me and he was very kind. He just pulled me aside and quietly said, Hey, listen, go apologize to the linesman. You know, that that's not acceptable. You need to treat these guys with respect. I was a rookie. That was something that I needed to hear. Wow. And I, I thoroughly appreciated that from McCreary. So I went back over. He was right. I made my apology. And that was a lesson learned for me as a young player in the league. And it stayed with me for a long time. But it, it was, it was a, a gesture from McCreary that showed that he cared about me. Well, I had a scenario when I was in Boston. And I wasn't playing that well. And usually Burnsy skates over and morning skates like ace get your game together. And that's usually enough to have you on his radar. You want to play better. Well, I think my first shift, I'm going to turn the puck over dash one right away. I think I was on the leaderboard for the masters. It was, it wasn't very pretty at all. And he sat me, but then we had a conversation about it. We had morning skate the next game and I played like 30 minutes the next game. I couldn't play enough. Like I was on my toes. I was jumping. I might have three or four points that game, but it was an example where he got my attention I knew I wasn't playing that well. I went back and watched some video. I, could, I saw where I could clean my game up, and then I put in the work. It wasn't about sulking. He wasn't trying to embarrass me, but that was the key. Like, I knew Burns' intentions were real. He wanted to get the most out of me as a player. He wasn't trying to show me up. So when players understand that about your coaching staff, they'll go through the wall for those guys time and time again. Very cool. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. I love those two stories. Uh, the team that Columbus is looking up to right now are the Chicago Blackhawks, who are, you guys, I mean, you have to think that this is one of the biggest surprises of the season so far as we're at about the quarter mark. No Jonathan Taves out for, you know, the foreseeable future with an illness. No Brent Seabrook still on, uh, in, he's injured. Kirby Doc is injured. I mean, all signs were against the Chicago Blackhawks coming into this season. A lot of young players, you've got some veteran presence with a Patrick Kane back there and goaltending was questionable. Malcolm Subban taking a lot of it. Uh, Lankinen playing a lot of games as well for Chicago, but nothing really as far as a bona fide number one at this point in net. I mean, all signs pointed to Chicago, including opening up against the defending Stanley Cup champion Tampa Bay Lightning as, oh my gosh, this team is going to have a hard time this year. And lo and behold, they are winning games and they're doing it the right way. Ace, would you consider the Chicago Blackhawks the biggest surprise so far of the season? They have to be up there in the conversation, KT. I mean, I love crushing the Blackhawks to start the season off and watching <laughs> Kirby's face and see how he's going to tap dance around that one. But you've got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, I felt bad for Malcolm Subban to start the season off when they played against Tampa Bay and Tampa was just tic-tac-toeing around on the power play. 
Uh, he's played well for them. And so is Lankin, too. Lankin, it looks to me like he can be a potential number one netminder for the Chicago Blackhawks, just like how Corey Crawford came up and solidified that position for years. But it all comes down to showtime, as far as I'm concerned. Patrick Kane. You've got no Jonathan Taves in that lineup, sprinkled with tons of young players. And Patrick Kane is doing what Patrick Kane does best, making plays, being consistent, and he's bringing the Brinkett back to where the Brinkett has been in previous years. He had that dip last year. I thought that contract was a bit of an anvil on his back, but now the cat is playing like the cat. He's nimble, he's fast, and he's bearing all those great passes from Patrick Kane. Patrick Kane really is incredible. He's been my favorite player to watch in this league for a long time. The stuff he does out there is like a video game. It's just incredible what he's able to do. And the fact that is he's able to do it no matter who's around him, as things change, I mean, it's even more of a testament to his greatness. For me, also, he's inspired a whole generation of American players, including, you know, Austin Matthews and Jack Hughes and and more like them. It's it's really special what he's done for, for hockey and especially in this country. So great to see him continuing to do it. For me, I was one of those guys that was writing the Blackhawks, Blackhawks off early in the season. I think even out of 50... 56 game schedule is going to be a long year for them. I still expect there to be some bumps in the road and some aggression uh, as the season goes on, but these guys are getting their opportunity. Guys like Lankin and uh, another guy, a guy I played with actually in Switzerland, Pia Suter. I played on the line with him, sat next to him in, in Zurich. Um, so, you know, I had a little bit of an up close and personal look at him before he came over He's a very heady player. He's, he's a two-way smart player, not the biggest guy, but a real competitor. He's done really well so far, including a hat trick uh, to open his career uh, sc scoring. So guys like that that have been given opportunity are playing well, but also what we know about young players is, that they, is they have ups and downs early on, and it takes a while to kind of establish that consistency, and I expect the same for the Blackhawks as a team. And someone you guys haven't mentioned yet is Jeremy Colleton. And I know Sharpie brought it up on the broadcast on Sunday, but you know, this is a coach that had some pretty big shoes to fill and he's only a couple seasons into his term, but now I think we're starting to see the fruits of his labor. He's holding players accountable. He's got them playing a certain way. Uh, you know, they're, they're responsible defensively. And Jeremy Colleton is now probably finally feeling like this is his team. Um, he's got a good handle on these guys. The veterans respect him and the young players do as well. So uh, I like Chicago. I like where they're at. Uh, if they can get some of those other names back in the lineup, they're going to be even better. So looking forward to seeing what the Hawks can do. And you know what else I'm looking forward to, guys? This weekend in Lake Tahoe. I'm very upset, <laughs> Ace, as you mentioned. You know, normally this would be a situation we'd be on site for these games uh, due to COVID restrictions. You know, we have a, a small broadcast team on site on the weekend. But this Saturday at 3 Eastern, Colorado and Vegas face off in Lake Tahoe. Sunday at 3 Eastern, it's the Bruins and the Flyers as the NHL meets the great outdoors, uh, both games on NBC. Dom, I'm going to start with you. You played in three outdoor games. You had two at Yankee Stadium as a member of the New York Rangers, which were awesome games, freezing cold, I might add. I was at those. And I was also at the Naval Academy when you and the Toronto Maple Leafs went and played the Washington Capitals. So with all this experience you have in these outdoor games, what is the most exciting part about playing in these games? You know, I have to say these, the outdoor games are in the top five or six games of my career in terms of memorable games. Obviously I was fortunate to play in almost a thousand regular season and playoff games, over a hundred playoff games. And obviously some of those game seven stand out and in those uh, playoff runs, but you know, beyond that, the, the outdoor games are incredible special memories for me as a player. I remember being at Yankee stadium and as a, as a sports fan in general, knowing the hallowed ground that you're standing on at Yankee stadium. I mean, I remember, you know, my warm up before the game, I decided to, to go out and, and play catch baseball catch uh, just outside the dugout as a way to kind of embrace the moment. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget that day. And, you know, Lake Tahoe is one of my favorite places on earth. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, so what a spectacular spot that they've chosen to do this um, so, Ace, I think it would be great to see more of this going forward, don't you? Yeah, Dom, I never played an outdoor game, but the first game I called, my first NHL game, was the game Dodger Stadium, Ducks, L.A. Kings. I thought I was out there just doing some sideline stuff, <laughs> a little beach volleyball, a little roller skating out there at Dodger Stadium. 
And we had a pre-production meeting, maybe at five o'clock, I think it was, uh, Pacific time. And I remember we broke the meeting and our executive producer, Sam Flood, said, okay, Ace, you're in the booth with Strades. And I was like, what? The booth? Like, what, what, what do you mean the booth? Like, Strades will be down low, the, like the beach volleyball and all the activities? Like, no, you're upstairs. So I'm upstairs where Vin Scully, the legendary Vin Scully, would sit to call baseball games next to the legend, Dave Strader. And you've got Brian Englum, who was down between the benches. And I couldn't believe my mind. I was like, this is my first NHL game that I found out about just 10 minutes before, literally, that I get to call this game at Dodger Stadium where everyone's dressed looking like me in golf shirts. I think it might have been like 65 degrees outside. But it, it was, you're right, Dom. Like, it was an event. It wasn't a game as far as I'm concerned. It was an event. It was a spectacle. And people don't really remember the scores of those games. They just remember being there and being present and being a part of that. Well, what's really cool is that for the teams, it is more than an event. It's a big two points on the line. So what's even more awesome when you're sitting at home watching is you know that these games count. It's not just a gimmick out there. Um, you know, for me, Lake Tahoe is a special place, Dom. I agree with you. It is so gorgeous in the wintertime. I've skied there at Squaw. And in the summertime, I've played at this event, the American Century Championship, for six years. That 18th hole, I birdied once. And I'm very proud of it. A par <laughs> five dog leg left over the water. So I'll take that home with me. But I can tell you that it is going to be spectacularly beautiful watching this on TV. And I'm super excited to hear uh, the broadcast team of uh, Mike Tirico and Edzo and Boo will be out there for us. And uh, it'll be it'll be awesome. It's a beautiful place. Excited for that one. And then, of course, guys, on Sunday before the game starts, we've got a special documentary for our beloved Doc Emmerich, um, which is going to be just really, really special. A lot of players from the game chiming in, a lot of his colleagues. And I had a great, um, great benefit of being a part of this documentary as well, sitting down and sharing some of my memories about Doc which I felt like I just wasn't eloquent enough. I felt like I wasn't doing Doc Emmerich justice by telling my favorite stories of him. But um, this is gonna be a really special tribute to Doc, who we miss dearly. We love hearing his call. Um, certainly we wish him the best in his retirement. But uh, Ace, let me start with you as far as your favorite stories of Doc and, and how much you're looking forward to this special that's gonna air Sunday at two o'clock on NBC. First of all, I never got the memo to participate in this documentary. Like what's going on? <laughs> No one ever called me. We have me. you doing enough, Ace. Your schedule's I, already booked I up. I paid my phone bills. No one's calling me. <laughs> but, no. but all seriousness, KT, uh, it's been a treat to work with Doc and watch Doc work. Going to Stanley Cup Finals games and watching him prepare, going to locker rooms with him. He always has his briefcase in his binder full of all of his notes. And I had the pleasure to work with Doc. I mean, how many people can say they actually sat side by side with the great Doc Emmerich? And I could see him work. And I had to pinch myself. I said on the broadcast, just sitting next to him, texting my friends, like, holy smokes, I'm sitting next to Doc Emmerich right now. And I'm trying to not take, like, pictures of us, like, next to each other <laughs> working. I'm trying to focus on the ice. But you hear that voice that you're so used to hearing calling games, but now he's sitting or standing right next to you. It was one of those surreal moments that I'm forever grateful for because he's going to go down in history as one of the best to ever do it. Yeah, for me, the biggest thing I remember about Doc is just uh, the conversations we would have after a morning skate where he would come in the room and, and chat with some of the guys. And inevitably, he and I would always chat for a while. He's just such a gentleman um, and just a genuine person. And we used to talk about where, he's, where he lives, you know, on Lake Huron, which is, you know, on the Michigan side across from where I was born. And um, so we used to kind of reminisce about those places and just always – fun uh just having those casual conversations that's what i'll remember most about doc uh, aside from just being the icon of the game that he is and dom you know what too also when it comes to doc and walking the rooms he can walk into any room freely because of what he did as a play-by-play -play. Like as an analyst and you're calling games sometimes you have to call guys out so it could be a little uneasy sometimes you walk into rooms when you're pointing out players mistakes that's not what doc did that wasn't his role in the broadcast so he was universally loved by everyone because it was Doc's job to make everyone look and sound great when they're on the ice. Absolutely. Yeah, guys, no question. We all have so many great memories with Doc. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey, so he was the voice of the devils for my entire childhood and uh, got an opportunity to listen to games from him. But I think, as you said, Ace, working alongside Doc, seeing the way he 
function, seeing going to the rink with him during Stanley Cup finals. And like you, they asked me for the documentary for some pictures that I have of myself and Doc, and I have one. And it was taken <laughs> when we did a hit for Football Night in America to promote the game at Notre Dame Stadium, the Winter Classic. And I thought, my gosh, all these years with Doc. But like you said, you just don't even want to interrupt him or, or bother him by asking <laughs> to take a picture. But I will say one of my best treasures with Doc is uh, a book that he wrote recently, his memoir that came out off mic. Uh, and I, I, I bought a copy for myself and I sent it to Doc with a prepaid FedEx stamp to come back to my house. And I asked him to write something and I'm not gonna tell you what he wrote, but I will tell you, I will cherish it forever because uh, his words mean so much to me and his words over a five decade career have meant so much to the game of hockey. So I'm really looking forward to that tribute on Sunday. I know you guys are as well. and. We have a great weekend of outdoor games, too, to look forward to. So uh, anyway, well, that's going to do it for us, guys. Any final thoughts or are you all talked out uh, for now? <laughs> I think that was the, the most appropriate last word. Well done. <laughs> I might have to, KT, when I watch this, I'm going to do like what I did with the Reddit commercial Super Bowl. I'm going to have to pause it and go back and see if I could read those notes. Oh, no, <laughs> don't give anyone ideas, no. It's just special to me, but anyway, go get Doc's book. It's awesome if you haven't read it already. Uh, the Voice of Hockey, we'll look forward to that feature. And as always, guys, fun to do Our Line Starts With You. Looking forward to another time down the road. I can't wait, and I'm glad that uh, Dom lost his Larry King mic. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I got the iPad out today, so no eight-ball mic today. Hopefully, hopefully the audio is decent. Ha, ha, ha.